Amen. As I relate one of the wondrous events of the cross, I'm going to be through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but if you would just turn to Luke 23, that's where we will end tonight. And if your fingers are nimble and you want to try to keep up with me, I'll give you where I am, but I'd rather you just stay at Luke 23. And notice that if you have titles in your scripture, you'll notice that Jesus was crucified between two criminals. And the Bible tells us in the Gospels in Matthew 26 that when Jesus had finished saying all these things, He told His disciples that the Son of Man would be handed over to be crucified. For three years, Jesus had spoken all the things to the people. He had taught His disciples. He had told them that this day was coming. He finished saying all these things. And Jesus knew from the Father that when the time was come, all the words will have been spoken, and then the act, the passion, would begin. Jesus was crucified not by the will of the Jews or the Romans or the people of the world, but Jesus was crucified by the God of heavens who said, The Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Jesus declared that he came to save the lost, and Jesus declared himself the way, he declared himself the truth, and he declared himself the life. And he said that no person could see God except through himself, Christ, the Son of God. They crucified Jesus because he claimed to be equal with the Father. God crucified his Son so that the people may not perish but have everlasting life. God crushed Christ that men and women might live. And so he so loved us that he sent his only begotten Son. That's God's love that we share to all people. But there is a nourishment to the church that we need to understand as well. And that's going through the remembrance of that night and into Friday that we call Good Friday. It nurtures the church to understand all that Christ went through. And I hope you're like me that the more we hear the story, the more our heart yearns to be closer and closer to Christ Jesus. As the moments were approaching... Jesus demonstrated his love to his disciples. Minister Gaines read to us the washing of their feet. We we see the love of Christ poured out on the disciples before this night. He gave us the example to live towards one another. Then we see in Scripture that Jesus gave them a remembrance that we just observed together as a church. And and what was was happening through the elements of the blood and, and and the bread. And the Bible says they went out from there, they were singing a hymn together, and then the Bible tells us that Jesus' heart began to grieve, began to mourn. And so the hour was approaching more and more rapidly. The Bible says that Jesus came to a place called Gethsemane and he prayed. We know that he prayed three times and we know that he prayed that not his will be done, but the Father's will. And as this time drew Just moments away, Matthew records in chapter 26 that he came back from prayer to the disciples and he said to them, See, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. See, my betrayer is near. And so this begins the night of betrayal. The night of arrest. A mock trial that had enormous, enormous dishonesties, deceit, derision, and disdain toward the Son of God. They spit on Him. They, they beat Him. They scourged Him with whips that tore at His flesh. The Bible tells us and shows us that Jesus said very little during this whole time, and, and He actually spoke mostly of what, what Pilate said or something that came directly to him as the Son of God, but all the other accusations and blasphemies, Jesus remained silent as a lamb going to the slaughter. Jesus said little because Jesus had spoken it all from the beginning. 
We have the record from Genesis to Revelation. We have recorded God's word. We have the fulfillment of God's word. And so there was nothing left for Jesus to say. He had spoken it to us. And now was the time of demonstration, not words. The world would not hear. And the world would not see. And so they miss what this meant for eternity in their hearts. The Bible says, who has believed what we have heard? Much of the world that night and into Friday and throughout Friday went about its business. Have you ever noticed that the the, the merchants that Jesus drove out of the temple on that Monday were back in the temple on Thursday and Friday selling their wares. The people were still buying. The hustle of the town and the bustle of the town was still going on. The religious were preparing for the, the Passover. All was going about as usual, as if nothing dramatic was even taking place that day. And it's much the same today. The world goes about its business as if nothing is even happening. Nothing significant. They have placed this event with Bethlehem in the pages of religion with little change or, or little consequence to their heart. They enjoy the holiday with their friends and their families, but they think little, if any, that the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Severely. I was amazed this morning that uh, the people that I spoke to before I went to my home office to study, in fact, everyone I spoke to, had not even a thought of a Thursday or a Friday worship time. Most of the people that I spoke to uh, when I filled the car up with gas or what didn't even think about Easter as any different Sunday from the rest of the Sundays. On that day, <clears throat> the reality of Scripture that with or without those in the world contemplating or changing to Christ's cross and what was about to take place, the Bible says that they led him away to crucify him. The Bible says, again, they crucified him there. And the Gospel of John through the Holy Spirit says, carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and two others were with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. There were two robbers crucified with Jesus. They were crucified at the same time, in the same place, under the same guard. Two highwaymen, or robbers upon the road, as the word from Greek tells us. It's probable that, that this day was, an appoint, it was appointed by the Roman Empire to be an execution day. Whatever it was, whether it was a proper execution day or if it just happened to come about this day, what we do know is that Scripture was fulfilled on this day. He was numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12. Some of you guys know that I love to read Matthew Henry, a great commentator of the past, uh, uh, centuries uh, past. He wrote about this passage, he says it was a reproach to Jesus that he was crucified with them. Jesus was made to partake with the vilest of scoundrels in their plagues, as if he had been a partaker with them in their sins. He was at his death numbered among the transgressors that we at our death might be numbered with the saints. He goes on to write, it was an additional reproach that he was crucified in the midst between them as if it had been the worst of the three, the principle of the wrongdoer. For among the three at that time, the middle was the place for the most vile offender. And there they crucified him. And there the blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. But not only just our sins, but for the sins of the whole world, 1 John chapter 2 says. So Jesus, as he carried his cross to that spot where he would be crucified, Jesus saw, even in his condition, women along the road. They were crying and weeping for him. And Jesus says in Luke 23, he turns to them, 
daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Look, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the women who are without children, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it's dry? If they do these things when they think judgment is far away, will never come to them, what will they do when judgment has come? He says, weep for yourselves and for your children. Another thing I thought of today is when was the last time the church in our culture had a good cry for our sins and for our children? Our sins, the things that we do that our children see and our children who grow up with homes in homes that don't even know the name of Jesus. They don't even know what the inside of a church looks like. They don't know what a Sunday school is. They don't know what a Bible is. They don't know the difference between right and wrong other than what the moral culture says. It changes every decade. They have no clue who Jesus is and have we weeped for our children. Jesus' agony, his pain, and the wrath suffered went on, according to Scripture. And the world went on about their business. And then we find two criminals, along with all the others, were yelling insults, and continuing to mock Jesus, and they taunted him. Matthew tells us that those who passed by were yelling yelling insults towards Jesus. These were the travelers coming into Jerusalem. They were coming in on the highways to the outside of the city, and they saw three crosses, but yet they insulted the person in the middle. In the same way, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders mocked the one who, who it was written, the king of the Jews. Luke 23 even says the soldiers mocked Jesus. The taunts were significant. I'm not going to explain the three taunts, just make a comment, but I want you to notice in Matthew 27 and in Luke 23, there there are primarily three taunts that they gave Jesus. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from that cross. Remember, the criminals are joining in on these taunts. And so they're saying to Jesus, you said you would destroy the temple, so rebuild it. Save yourself. The, the rumor had gone out that Jesus was a terrorist. That he, he was going to destroy the literal temple in Jerusalem. Their idol of worship. And Jesus had been talking about himself. And he said, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And so they're taunting him, saying, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. You know what they were really saying? If if you go back and you study the cross, they would impale the person on the cross as it laid on the ground. And then there were two ropes on the arms of the cross. And two soldiers would begin to to drag that cross until there was was a hole pre-dug. And the cross, the base of it, would hit the side of that hole and stop so that the cross would start lifting up in the air as the soldiers continued to pull the ropes. And as they continued to pull the ropes, the cross became more and more vertical until the cross went into the hole. And the whole body of Jesus would be racked and shocked as it hit the ground. And only the nails, the spikes, would keep Jesus on that cross. They said, if you're God, The base of his feet was right next to the ground because the cross went down into the hole. So as you hung on the cross, it looked as if you could just put your foot out there. You could walk off the cross. It was an illusion. It was a cruelty that the Romans put upon those who were crucified. As they would gasp for air, they could see the ground right there. If I could just put my foot out. So the crowd said, if you're you're God... If you're the Son of God, if you're equal with the Father, then come down from the cross. Others shouted, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Now, this proves that Jesus did his miracles. For all those experts out there who say miracles didn't exist, that the Bible made them up, whatever, this proves, he said, you saved others. Well, how did he save others? He made the blind to see and the the lame to walk, the the deaf to hear. He made the mute to speak. He took the leper's disease and cleansed it. They said, Jesus, if you could do all that, 
then save yourself. How about Lazarus, who was probably there witnessing this whole thing? The Pharisees never once denied that Lazarus was brought back to life. They said, how are we going to stop Jesus from doing these things so he doesn't turn the whole world upside down? They didn't deny it. Why do experts today deny it? Nobody then denied it. It was true. Lazarus was raised from the tomb. But what about the centurion's daughter? What, what about the widow's son? You saved others, but you can't save yourself. You're the king of Israel. You have all power. Come down now from the cross, and we will believe in you, they said. There's two things you need to see about that. Number one, they wouldn't believe in Jesus if he had stepped down off the cross. They would not have believed Jesus if he had ruled out the, the Roman Empire, wiped him out, walked off the cross, completely healed. They wouldn't have believed because they saw Lazarus who had been dead for four days come out of the tomb and they didn't believe Jesus. Jesus spoke for three years the words of God. He proved he was God through the miracles, the actions that he did. And he was proving he was God by allowing himself to be obedient to the Father even until death. They wanted to see another work. They wanted to mock this guy called Jesus. And so they said, he saved others. Let him save himself if this is, the God, if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. They just wanted Jesus stopped. They didn't want to believe that he was God. They just wanted him stopped. The third thing they said is, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. This is the second thing you need to understand. That, that They said, we'll believe in you, which was a lie. And now, they don't even understand their condition. They said, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If God rescued Jesus on the moment that Jesus was on the cross, then you and I have no salvation. They were condemning themselves by saying, let God rescue him. God was not going to rescue Jesus. God was going to glorify the name of Jesus that he had with God from the very beginning. But he must go through the cross so that you and I might be saved. Jesus went through the cross. We know on the third day he was raised to life. And God has placed his name above all other names. For there is no name in heaven which man can be saved except that name, Jesus Christ. He trusts in God like God rushing. Christ was not, was not trying to get God to save him. But he was crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Because all the wrath of God was pouring out on him so that you and I could be made clean before God. The mocking went on and on. And Jesus suffered on and on. But I want you to pause and see something incredible that happened on the cross. This is in Luke 23. Something happened. One of the criminals saw himself and then he looked to Jesus. One of the criminals saw himself and then he looked to Jesus. A man or a woman cannot be saved in Christ until they first look at themselves and then look onto Jesus. There were two criminals, and the Bible says they both mocked Jesus. And in fact, verse 39, one of the criminals that was hanging there began to yell insults at Jesus. Listen to what he says. Aren't you the Messiah? He had heard that Christ was the one that was promised. Aren't you the one that God sent? Save yourself in us. He was a criminal. He stood condemned. And he's asking Jesus to save himself and him, the criminal. He wanted Jesus just to take them off the cross and, and just save him without understanding who he was. Now, now, Here's what's going on. The criminal knew he was condemned and he wanted salvation. But he didn't want to do anything about what he had been condemned for. He saw himself as somebody who could mock Jesus and say, save yourself in us. He continued to mock. All the Gospels record this thing about the two but only Luke says, one answered the other. One criminal answered the other criminal. And so you have the one criminal saying, save yourself. 
and me. And then you have the other one that says, don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? Stop for a moment. At some point during this weekend, that criminal, that, that highwayman, that, that, that guy who had the same character who attacked the uh, person on the road that the Samaritan stopped and helped, a highwayman would rob someone on the roads by beating them up to near death or leaving them there for dead, take their stuff and go back into the city. They were robbers. They were thieves. They were terrorists. And so this person on the cross, not confronting who he was, he had been condemned at some point. A court had said guilty, and the punishment is crucifixion. Jesus had gone through a mock trial, and they had uh, said, crucify him, crucify him. And, and Pilate said, why? I find no fault in him. That's not what they said about this other guy on the cross. It's not what they said about either of the two guys on the cross. It was a definite guilty, but Pilate said, why? I, know find, I find no fault in this man. And they even said, he calls himself God. He makes himself something. Pilate says, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. But to the two criminals on the cross, there was a definitive guilty verdict. And so this man on the cross didn't fear God. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 40, I want you to underline, if you take notes in your Bible, don't you even fear God. Have you ever met someone and you shared Christ with them and they just have no interest in the gospel? Have you known someone in your life where if you mention church, they scoff and they snuff and they go, I don't need that. Have you ever met someone in your life, they just do their own thing and they could care less what the consequence is? The book of Acts talks about these kind of people, and it's that person who was on the cross who was mocking Jesus. In Acts chapter 10, verse 35, there's an answer why some people can't come to Christ. And it's not God preventing them, it's the person's heart. Look what Acts chapter 10, verse 35 says. In every nation, so that's the whole world, the whole globe, in every nation... The person who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. The first part, fear God. This criminal did not fear God who was on the cross. There are people in our culture who do not fear God. God says don't, and they continue to do it. There are people in the church who are living in rebellion against Christ Jesus, their Savior, right now. Jesus said, don't, and we say, but everybody else is doing it. I want to be like the world, and they just keep doing it with no fear to God. Do we fear God? You say, well, isn't that a respect word? Yes. How can you respect someone if you don't love someone, and how can you love someone if you don't obey someone? So fear is a reverential fear. It's, ooh, he's the boss. I better do what he says. How many people treat God as sovereign? What he says goes, and whatever I might think doesn't matter. It's only what God says. The book of Acts tells us if we want to find salvation, we must be like those in every nation who fear God and do what is right. What is right? Believe the one whom he sent. This criminal would have no part. This criminal represents uh, most of the vast majority of the world that scoffs at religion has no use for religion. But the other criminal says, don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment. He was condemned to die on a cross. The other, the other criminal says, we are punished justly. Why would he say that? We robbed someone and hurt them and now we're being punished properly. He goes on to say, because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did, but this man has done nothing wrong. He saw the righteousness, he saw the holiness of Christ on the cross. And then there was an incredible confession. He rebukes the other guy. We're not, we don't know what happens to the other Well, we probably know what happens to the other guy. But Scripture gives us no evidence to the confession of the other one. But it immediately breaks to this incredible criminal condemned to die, next to Jesus, 
Jesus has done nothing wrong. And he looks at Jesus in whatever way he could on that cross, and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I think as a church sometimes when we share the gospel, we make confessions too complicated. Uh, come up here, say, I admit I'm a sinner. Uh, I, I believe this. I'm, you know what you need to tell God? That the one he sent cleansed me of my sins. I want Jesus as my Savior. Church, you know what we need to do when we stumble and we do things that we shouldn't do? Jesus, remember me. We, we just need to be honest with God. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said the most incredible thing. He says, truly I tell you today, not tomorrow. Truly I tell you, not at the end of your life. Not sometime in the distant future after you've been in the grave for decades and millennia, then you get to go to the kingdom. He doesn't say any of that nonsense that religion teaches. He said, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. I'm in paradise right now. You want to know why? Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. When my paradise doesn't feel like paradise, I can say it's paradise because Jesus Christ is my paradise. When everything is falling apart, I know it's together because Jesus Christ is not the order of chaos. He is the God of order. So I look to him. And Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What do we do this with two criminals on the cross? I want to close with something I read this week. And I'm taking the names out because it has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with what was said. And I want you to hear this. In 2016, there was a gentleman who wrote, um, yeah, there was a gentleman who wrote an article. And he was representing Wheaton College. If you're familiar with Wheaton College, it's a Christian college. That's where Billy Graham went to school. And he was writing, and it was in reference to religions and whether certain religions are saved or not. It's the age-old question. Do all roads lead to the same God? And this gentleman wrote, they do not have God because they have rejected Jesus Christ as son and they stand condemned. Well, it just so happens about a year later that this gentleman gets nominated to serve in a high position in the cabinet of the president. He has to go through a Senate hearing. Guess what came up at the Senate hearing? The senator and you can Google this. You can see the whole interview. The senator, senator said, do you believe what you wrote? He said it several times. The senator asked the nominee, do you believe people who are not Christians stand condemned? He then turned around and said, do you believe specifically People of different religions, and then he names it Jewish, Muslim. Are you telling me they stand condemned today? And the man stood strong and said, sir, I am a Christian. And he explained himself. And I want you to understand the world wants you to back down and say, well, we, we don't mean necessarily condemned. No, people are condemned outside of Christ. I have a cousin going to hell because he does not believe in Jesus Christ. That should cause me to weep, not to judge him. But he stands condemned. Why? Because Jesus said, if you do not believe me, you stand condemned already. The only thing I, and, and I've never been put in this position, so I'm certainly not judging this Christian who had to take that fire. But I just kept, the whole time I'm watching the, prayer, the video, I'm saying, come on, say it, say it, say it. And I wanted him to say, Jesus said you're condemned, not me. The world wants to blame us for saying it. Hey, I got the best news to tell people because when someone gets upset with me, I say, look, I'm just the bus driver. I don't own the bus. <laughs> it's not my message. I'm just the messenger. Don't let people get you in that trap of condemning people. I have no authority to condemn anyone. People, men and women born into this world, stand condemned already, alienated from God, until they look upon the cross of Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, remember me. The confession is to see who we are. The confession 
is to understand it does not matter what I believe concerning other people or religions. What matters is what Jesus has spoken, what Jesus has done, and is now glorified at the right hand of the Father. Jesus removed our condemnation, which comes from our sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus paid in full the condemned sentence of each one of us upon that cross of Calvary. His blood poured out for the payment. And since by Jesus' words we stand condemned already, we need to be like the thief on the cross and see that we are condemned from birth and we should cry out, Jesus, remember me. It is Jesus alone that our condemnation is removed and we are made righteous in Christ to God. What I wish, wish the gentleman had said, which again, I've never been in that position of attack, but what needs to be said is religions of water, works, ethics, and morals do nothing to remove the stain of sin or our condemnation. Only the blood of Jesus Christ shed on that cross removes the stain, the guilt, and the shame, and the penalty that is due our sin. In Christ is the power of salvation. We begin officially Easter on Palm Sunday. But our forgiveness was brought to us on what we call Good Friday when Jesus' blood poured out. And we anticipate in our hope to come in victory on Sunday because what was sealed on Sunday, the Lord's Day, is our eternal life when Christ Jesus arose from the grave. And the Bible says, because Jesus lives, we too shall live. As we sing this last song, which I believe is the cross at the cross, or did I say it wrong? I'm sorry? Old rugged cross. I was, I was close with the cross. Um, as we sing the old rugged cross, I want you to, to sing the words because they're beautiful, but I want you to also meditate on the fact that there were two men with Jesus on the cross. Do we have the confession of the one who said, don't you know that we deserve our punishment? But Jesus is innocent. Have we looked in the mirror to see our son, weeped over it, and praised God that he would come and die on a cross and pay for it so that for all of eternity we shall rejoice in the presence of the Father?